what I thought I'd do is uh, talk a little bit about all the moving pieces about water having to do with the Delta and California's uh, sort of water and political situation and where we're trying to head because the topic that was assigned in many ways was um, can we actually decide something uh, which is actually the heart of the question and I know for a lot of you that work on technical things you're in deep about the technical work but then trying to understand the politics or the policy or what actually causes a decision to be made is a totally different thing and in trying to think about how to talk about this it, one of the interesting things to me is that everybody locked themselves into their narrative about water from some different experience and for many people in California it never changes. Uh, you, as was mentioned uh, I wrote my undergraduate thesis at UC Santa Cruz uh, on the history of water development in California and from that perspective at that time uh, the water project was being built uh, it primarily served the Central Valley in Southern California how could somebody that was from the coast and generally environmentalist ever in their career get to a point that you might actually impact water policy and much to my amazement uh, uh, I am now in a leading role in California uh, coming from that in 1982 which was the last when the voters turned down the proposal for the peripheral canal which I'll talk about a little bit along the way many Californians just lock themselves into what they think about the Delta or water policy out of that experience and the whole world has changed since then in many many different ways and yet they're still sort of locked in in what happened uh, for some of us there's probably about five of us in the room that experienced the drought in the mid 1970s uh, where I lived in Santa Cruz at the time I bought my house and promptly lost everything in the yard. Uh, we had to sign under a penalty of perjury how many people lived in the house and then we were allowed 53 gallons a day uh, and that went for almost two years. It changed our life in any of a number of ways and how we used water and how valuable it was and for people that sort of came of age during that even though there's many years they tend to be much more efficient it's not unlike I'm sure growing up during the depression and how it formed your views about money uh, for me I always feel like water is a luxury if it's there it could go away at any time because I actually experienced a, a time when it significantly did and so people look through their own prism and you know if you look at the different things that have changed that's in part in some ways the major issues in the change one for example is I, I spent nine years as mayor and a city council member in Santa Cruz it was the 1980s and I was the water wonk once again on the city council we served water to an area twice as large twice as many customers as residents of the city and we had water from nine different sources but it was almost predominantly surface water a few wells but almost predominantly surface water so we were very volatile to weather or droughts and it got down to we had one big reservoir and if the reservoir spilled in the winter then that was the message that we were okay there would be no water restrictions if it didn't spill uh, we weren't okay well two years ago it spilled and we had the tightest water restrictions in since the drought in the mid 70s and it's because climate change has already had its effect and is starting to change that water system so much of it is from streams and the city would take water from the streams into the spring because they would flow from the winter through April or May and in a lucky year into June and then your reservoir your few of your wells that was the backup you got through to the fall you got through to when it rained again now the streams have been drying up months earlier and as a result what was our sort of backup has become a central part of our source and it's because of the change in the climate and yet there's this huge debate going on about desalting in Santa Cruz 
where people have not changed how they think about the existing water supply and the fact that in a surface water system <clears throat> no significant new sources have been added in decades it's just been conservation and being more efficient and when you're more efficient and you have no new sources that means you better have reliability with what you have or you're really screwed and so and yet people don't think that way in what they do so if you look at the biggest moving pieces and I'm sure Phil talked about this and some of the other speakers but I'll talk about them in my way because it gets to the question about can we make a decision uh, when the water project was built in the 60s and 70s uh, it was basically take water out of the Delta have pumps at the base of the Delta not far from Tracy, put it in the aqueduct, there's storage at San Luis Reservoir, storage at Paris Dam by Riverside, water goes down the aqueduct, it serves the Central Valley and it serves um, Southern California. Well when that was built none of the modern environmental laws were in place. CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, not in place. Uh, endangered species, not in place. NIPA, not in place. And so for 40 years, we've been fighting in many ways to retroactively mitigate a project that was built 40 years ago when there were no laws requiring mitigations in place when it was built. That has led to tremendous conflict and sort of is part of, of why we're in trouble. Additionally, the the project was somewhat flawed in its design from the beginning. Not that the pumps didn't work, the canal didn't work, the reservoirs didn't work, but by building it at the south of the delta and pulling water essentially only from there, it reversed the flows of many streams and sloughs and bodies of water in the south delta. When you're dealing with an estuary and salinity in the bay, uh, it actually would draw salt sort of toward it. Um, and it was really bad for fish because uh, it just went straight into the pumps. No real screens. If they're baby fish, real fish, tremendous loss. Wasn't designed to deal with fish. From the beginning, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, which was the Department of Fish and Game until for a century until January 1st, uh, really argued against uh, that as an operating system, that it was not going to protect fish. So you had a problem that it wasn't good for fish and that it reversed flows. So fundamentally uh, uh, problematic. And then when you have issues of fish crashing the populations, there were other things in the delta that really affected it. And, and you know, the, the statistic that always rings with me is that when Europeans arrived in California, there were over 500,000 acres of wetlands in the Delta. There are 31,000 acres now. And what it's meant is the, the so-called Delta Islands uh, have been armored with levees to protect it for agriculture, homes, whatever it is that are on the islands. But in many ways, a lot of that area was wetlands before that happened might have been converted to farmland or converted to residential or other uses. In the armoring of the levees, uh, fish do well uh, in certain parts of their cycle, reproductive cycle, in marshy habitat, in places where they can spawn, be safe. When a lot of the river channels were armored with levees, so it's just a straight flow, that is not anything that necessarily uh, helps fish. And the islands that were formed where there's farming, the farming over many years has left to, to a subsidence of the level of the soil. If you, if you lose a level of uh, an inch of the soil a year, you can imagine what it would be. There are some islands in the delta, so-called islands, surrounded by levees, that are 10, 15, 20 or more feet below sea level now because of the farming and the subsidence that has happened. A lot of the soil there is of peat content. So if it floods, it's not necessarily the best. <clears throat> if it floods with salt water, uh, you can imagine what that does to the farmland, the ability of water quality, or fish. Uh, there was a storm in California 
1861 and 1862 where it rained all day and all night for I think it was the proverbial one it was 40 days it was something like that it uh, the Sacramento Valley flooded so far apart it became a huge lake that went across in some cases 25, 30, 35 miles if you were in the center of it you couldn't see the sides. Uh, your records tend to support that that happens every so often. Uh, if we have a major earthquake before we sort of think about the delta we have a storm like that uh, anything could happen. The levees could be overwhelmed, water interruptions of a lengthy time, even into the years for exports from the delta. If it happens in winter, it flows out at some point, but the levees are down. Uh, there's a potential for salt water draining in from the bay. If an earthquake happens and levees fail in a major way, salt water comes in from the bay within 36 to 48 hours. Uh, that's a fundamental issue. Water supply, habitat, uh, farming, all those things are at risk and that's what's at risk at the uh, uh, delta right now. If you were to bring back fish, uh, you'd be creating more wetlands, uh, you'd be bringing them back, more marshy land. There's issues of predators. Uh, I grew up in the town of Vallejo. Uh, we used to have, when I was a kid, the striped bass derby. My dad was a teacher in Crockett. He would fish under the Carquinas Bridge some days before he went to school. He was a member of the Crockett Striped Bass Club. I was shocked when I was in my 30s and I discovered that striped bass were non-native to the Delta. I just assumed, since they'd been there my whole life, they are predators for some of these other fish that are native, that are indicators of uh, health in the Delta. Uh, striped bass have become part of the water politics of the Delta. Uh, some people believe that if you could eliminate striped bass as a predator, some fish populations would come back without them having to change the amount of exports or flows in or out of the Delta. And it just never occurred to me that uh, that uh, the striped bass as a predator would be a fundamental thing people would fight about uh, in the Delta. And then when you look at climate change, uh, when I was in the legislature I chaired a uh, select committee on California water needs and climate change. There was a bunch of science done with regard to the Sierra snowpack. It basically, the Sierra snowpack is the water bank of California most of what's up there flows to the delta as part of this whole equation. Uh, a lot of the science is, is that uh, absent any change in emissions between now and 2100 that can affect greenhouse gases and the deterioration of the climate, uh, we would have maybe 48 or 50 percent of what we have now as Sierra snowpack on an annual basis. And the sea level, I chair the Ocean Protection Council, uh, we did, through the Ocean Science Trust, uh, science just for California on sea level rise. It doesn't differ much from uh, science that's done in other parts of the country, but basically there's a range. By 2050, sea level rise would go up by 14 inches in California, by 2100, by five and a half feet. And the thing about it is, is that's the middle of the range. If we, AB 32 really works, other countries really work, we lower our emissions, maybe it could be below that. If we don't curb greenhouse gas emissions, that it's much worse than we think it will be or can be, that actually could be the mid-range and it could be higher. With regard to the delta, much of which is below sea level and uh, relies on flows pushing salt water away a year, if there's less water flowing and the sea level is higher, that changes the ecology of the delta in a fundamental way. The other thing that has uh, really changed in recent years and, it, and is really good is changing patterns of use. Uh, people finally realize that uh, conservation, recycling, that those are part of the water future and the portfolio in California. When I went into the legislature over 10 years ago, the general view was is if you supported water conservation, you were a strong environmentalist that didn't want a dam, didn't have enough courage to say it, was looking for some proactive alternative. I think that has morphed now to people accepting the fact that it has to be part of the solution. 
And it seems like a little known fact, particularly here in Northern California, that the greater Los Angeles basin has grown by three million people in the last generation on exactly the same amount of water. So they have gotten more efficient. They thus far have used it to accommodate their growth. But the question is, is through recycling, further conservation, can they do more? Can we do more everywhere? Uh, in the southern part of my legislative district, which was the Monterey Peninsula, there's been a huge fight over water out of the Carmel River for decades, and the State Water Board ordered uh, them to take 11,000 acre feet uh, a year less from the Carmel River, which was like a two-thirds reduction. Uh, there's a deadline of 2016. There's been a moratorium on water hookups in the Monterey Peninsula, and by some measurements over the last a uh, decade, they have reduced their water use by 38% in that area. That is really significant. It tells you about the elasticity of water use if there are incentives or, or things you can do. In many parts of the state, uh, there have not been water meters or ag water measurement. Uh, there have been laws to change that. The, the meters in uh, urban areas that didn't have them, it was a very long phase-in period, but it's been almost 10 years since it was adopted. I think there's seven or eight years to phase in. Sacramento was one of the largest, if not the largest city in the state that did not have water meters. So, it, you know, for somebody like me in Santa Cruz, uh, it's actually on your bill exactly how much you used, how much uh, compared to how much you used last year. There's an ascending rate block structure. Uh, the water rate is lowest for your basic uh, needs. When you move up in water usage, the rate system moves up and you, it, it costs you more. That could never happen in Sacramento. You just, they just equally bill everybody, whether somebody uses a thousand gallons and, or somebody uses a hundred. Uh, there's no measuring, there's no incentive, there's no way to notice who's really doing it. That will change as meters come in there and, and other places in the state. The one thing about, um, about water conservation is that, as I said earlier, it increases the need for reliability of what you conserve too. If you cut in Monterey Peninsula, you cut to 38%, and they have a big visitor serving industry, uh, lots of things. They cannot cut much more. That means what they cut too has to be reliable. They can't uh, uh, absorb a 20 or 25% cut in a bad time. So that presents a big challenge in water planning and, and water delivery. And then even though everybody argues over the statistic um, between one-fifth and one-third of the energy used in California is used to collect, treat, deliver, or, you know, deal with the wastewater. That power deals with water in some way. Between one-fifth and one-third of California power just deals with water in that way. So if we're to the point of conserving water, it is also an energy issue uh, as well and very important. And then you get to the issue of financing. Um, which is always a challenge. The obvious thing is, is the user or the beneficiary should pay for the charges. And in the California water system, it has been a fundamental, or California water project, fundamental beneficiary pays operation. Since the water project was uh, started, constru construction was approved 50 years ago, 4% of the cost of the water project has come from the J state general fund. 96% has become from the users when they buy water and pay for their bills. And so the question is, who pays is a big part of it. And, and during the Schwarzenegger years, I was arguing against dams because the Oroville Dam, the only major dam that the state has ever built, uh, you know, they used to say in the floor of the legislature, we haven't built a dam in California in 35 years. And I stood up and said, that's the only dam we ever built. Uh, you know, it's not like we build them every so often. And that one was 3% general fund, 97% beneficiary pays. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was proposing new dams, and he was proposing at least 50% from the general fund and 50% from user pays, and at one point you could argue that it was up to 67% from the general fund, 
33% user pays, and at that point, you're dealing with building a dam that wouldn't pencil out otherwise. That's the reason nobody had built it. They weren't subsidized heavily. And I used to, I have this little riff where I talk about being a legislator that primarily rec uh, represented two counties that never imported water, uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey, but we paid 100% for our own water. And I was really resentful about paying 100% for our own water and then kicking kids off health care and closing schools and raising tuition to pay for somebody else's water as well. Uh, that wasn't right, that it was really beneficiary pays uh, ought to do it. So the economics are really important. And one of the problems is, is as we move in to an era where we're almost 38 million people in California now, uh, and we're, it's not like there's a lot of new water out there. It's a finite source. So we have to be efficient, but also people understand that they'll be paying as much for reliability rather than extra water. And the public doesn't always get that. They figure they should get more if they pay more. But the fact that they'll be paying so there's not a major interruption or the water goes away doesn't compute right. It's just like in a drought. Uh, there were so many water districts where there was an open revolt from the customers because they were asked to conserve and whenever they conserved they had to pay more and they didn't get it. They were using less and having to pay more but water delivery is a fixed cost and so the whole issue of paying for reliability and not necessarily massive growth in the amount of water delivery is something that the consumers aren't totally there yet. Storage, I mentioned it briefly. Storage is a word for dams. Uh, but the thing about it is, is that there's this whole difference. There are many opportunities still to store underground. There's a huge water bank in Kern that the Metropolitan Water District and the Kern Water District do that takes water and they can put it underground for further use, which allows to even out variances. Some places didn't do storage and if water's cut off at the delta, they, they lose water. It is a big problem. Metropolitan Water District of Southern California did not believe in underground storage until 20 or 25 years ago when they thought, we haven't been thinking about this right. And there was this perfect storm about six or seven years ago where there was this incredible drought year. I think it rained in the LA Basin 28% of normal. The Colorado River was in the seventh or eighth year of drought. That's where they get a lot of water. And a judge turned off the pumps at the Delta for a while. If they didn't have a million and a half acre feet in underground storage, uh, they wouldn't have been able to move water and manipulate it uh, uh, well. So that is a real issue. And yet, when I was negotiating uh, an attempt to have a water bond as part of the infrastructure bond package in the legislature in 2006, I have colleagues that thought, it wasn't real unless it's above ground, they can see it, it involves construction, then they just didn't think that was real storage. They thought underground was phony, uh, uh, they couldn't feel it and touch it. That's something that has to change. Another, uh, you know, two other minor things, but significant. When the state water project was built, I mentioned that everybody thought it was Central Valley and Southern California. Well, this changed. Uh, parts of the Central Coast, San Luis Obispo County, Morro Bay has a contract for state water. Uh, Silicon Valley is half of their water comes from state water from the Delta. In a drought, 80 to 90 percent of the Silicon Valley. Eastern Alameda County is on Delta water. Small parts of Contra Costa. It is not just a Southern California agricultural thing. And water rights confuse everything uh, and confuse people. Uh, but whoever has more senior water rights as opposed to who has more junior water rights, if somebody has junior water rights and there's a drought or there's cutbacks, they don't get their allotments to, uh, and the people with senior water rights do. People with senior water rights sometimes think we don't have to vote to fix anything because even if everything crashes, we'll still get our water. Sort of who has water rights really factors into the whole situation. So the question is, is where are we now and where can we go given all these moving pieces and how people think and talk about them? Um, 
the legislature in 2009, and this is probably what Phil Eisenberg talked about because it created, there was a massive water package and compromise that created the Delta Stewardship Council in its modern incarnation. But it, that water package created, it said that a project in the Delta, you should consider alternatives and you have dual co-equal goals. Uh, one goal is ecosystem restoration and another goal is determining and fixing water reliability. And as I'm fond of saying around the state, uh, most Californians are firmly committed to one of these goals. And yet there's a certain elegance to it because they can't get the goal they're committed to unless the other goal is met. And it has allowed us to move forward on planning. Part of it was a water bond that has now been moved to 2014. Part of it was a water conservation package that said uh, we will try to reduce per capita water consumption 20 percent by 2020. Um, and now the Brown administration uh, is trying to do some kind of long-term fix involving the Delta and these issues given all those realities. And in 1982, the uh, peripheral canal would have been sized at 21,000 cubic feet per second. A year ago, the proposal was two uh, tunnels, a dual conveyance around the delta for over 30 miles, uh, having intakes at the Sacramento River and taking them around to the beginning of the aqueduct. And that was 15,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, the governor and the secretary of interior uh, Ms. Uh, John, uh, Ken Salazar, who's just leaving, uh, jointly endorsed or suggested appropriately um, an alternative, a preferred alternative to be studied last July that was 9,000 cubic feet per second. So you look at 21,000 in 1982, it's 9,000, it is smaller, three intakes. And for the first time, there would be scientific objectives that would drive the process, which is that we would set in a permit uh, a whole decision tree on the scientific and biological restoration of the habitat in the Delta. And over 15 years of acquiring 2,000 acres of marsh land a year to help restore fish, at the end of that 15 years, when those two tunnels came online, the amount of water that would go through those tunnels would be set on the express scientific success or failure of restoring fish. If it was successful, it would be at a higher end of a range. If it wasn't successful, it would be at a lower end of a range. And that's what the Bay Delta Conservation Plan uh, does. Fish first, bio biologic goals in conjunction with the facility. And the interesting thing is, is, is what I've discovered since I've been secretary and, you know, I was asked how much time do I spend on water? Well, more time than anything else, but I have 25 departments, boards, commissions, conservancies. I deal with water, fire, forests, oceans, parks, fish and wildlife, energy siting, uh, conservation, conservation core, among other things. And yet I spend most of the time uh, on water. And in each of these things, I did negotiations in Tahoe to try to save the Tahoe Compact. Uh, we've been doing a big desert renewable plan with the federal government to try to deal with siting of renewables in the desert and protecting the habitat. And we've done marine reserves up and down the California coast to bring back fish populations. And every one of these things, including the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, we are trying to make the existing laws work or the existing processes work. So there have been runs at the Endangered Species Act by people that just want more water to go into the uh, certain places in California. Uh, why protect the species? We just want more water. We want to change or repeal parts of the Endangered Species Act. The Bay Delta Conservation Plan says we will, within the context of the Endangered Species Act, figure out how to uh, provide water and restore the habitat. We are trying to make that work. And that is a significant thing, because if we can't, it probably opens up further attacks on the Endangered Species Act. And so, right now, in essence, we have agreement on a couple of major things. We have agreement on 
uh, habitat restoration, although interestingly some people say we're restoring too much habitat, which it was a criticism I did not expect. Um, and in many ways, when I said it went from 500,000 acres of wetlands in the Delta when Europeans arrived to 31,000 acres now, it's because a lot of that is in agriculture. And so agriculture feels attacked if you're doing wetlands restoration. And it is trying to figure out how to work that out. I think there's fairly universal agreement on conservation and recycling that the fact that that has to be part of the solution. We have to do more than we're doing now. We have to implement the laws and the plans that we have. The issue just gets down to, shall we have a facility and what size? And when you're dealing with the possibility of a water interruption for three years, the fact that a facility might actually help restore fish in the context of things, the fact that it's size 40% <coughs> less than what the voters uh, rejected in 1982, that is a realistic debate. And yet, with everybody locked into their stuff, and believe me, sometimes I feel like I'm Nixon going to China. Uh, as somebody that had a 100% environmental record through my entire career, and uh, went to work in the 1970s for a member of Congress who represented the Delta. Uh, this is a unique place for me, but I think that we are doing, in essence, the right thing. And the fact that we have moved this project to fish first, biology sized uh, much less than it was in the past to do a 50 year or 75 year fix in the delta that involves restoring fish and ecosystem that is a reasonable goal and it is something that is achievable so the plan will be rolled out in draft form in the next few months there will be an environmental impact uh, process probably in July a draft environmental impact report will come out and then we will move into a formal public process to see if we can get to a permit and a project and it's based on all these things that are the moving pieces I call it the Rubik's Cube of public policy and it probably really is the minute you push in somewhere something else comes out but uh, we've been really working hard because it's gotten to the point that the status quo is unacceptable Fish populations could crash forever. Water could be interrupted to people uh, for years. There are things that if we don't take proactive steps, we won't address this. So, sorry, I went on a little longer than I wanted to. I want to leave whatever time is left for questions, but I wanted to sort of lay it out in different ways. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that you have. Um, so I'm wondering, should I ask you all the questions at once? Well, give it a go, but okay. don't use all the rest of the time. Um, I'm wondering who the main authors of the BDCP are. I've seen the steering committee um, diagram, and I don't know if that's everyone working together to write it, but I imagine there's some main authors. Well, before you go on to the next one, okay. uh, there's a consulting firm. Uh, it's being directed by, in many ways, state government and us to make sure that there are final decisions. Uh, the federal government is involved. Um, it, it's not just in a vacuum. Okay, and is the plan um, just the preferred alternative with the um, tunnel, or are there other alternatives that are part of the plan? That are there'll be other done? alternatives that will be studied in the environmental process. That'll be the preferred one, and I think it will be different sizes that are bigger and smaller and no project at all. But they all contain a tunnel? No project at all does not contain a tunnel. And if you look, you know, 3,000 is small enough that it probably is one tunnel or it's a smaller uh, version, but... Um. Um, I have more questions, but does someone else want to go? Why don't you ask one or two more, and then there we go. So you said that you said that you're trying to work within the existing framework to get things to change. So what do you think is it going to cause a shift in that paradigm from I want mine to cooperation between these disparate groups and co-equal goals? Well, part of it is to, and in case anybody didn't hear the question, you know, how do you think the paradigm has changed? So it's not everybody I want mine. I think that when the status quo is bad, 
you, you sit here and you try to accommodate as many interests as you can to get to a solution, which is what you try to do in any public policy thing within a scientific or public policy based framework as it is. We are attempting to do that. And, you know, there is a pot of $750 million in the bond that would go to the Delta counties. Well, we're going to try to. It, you, you know, work to meet whatever water or levy or other needs that Delta counties think are appropriate from that uh, uh, as well. And so we're just trying to work with everybody and it'll cause everybody to go to the edge of their comfort zone. Some of the environmentalists will freak at a 9,000 uh, uh, cubic feet per second tunnel, uh, even though it's 40% less than what uh, didn't lose by substantial margin 30 years ago. Um, it's just some of the farmers will want less habitat restoration. There will all be these things, and we will try to move as close as we can to as many of the interests in getting a solution that works and fits together. I don't know if that answered your question. but. <coughs> You talk about how uh, recycling has got to be part of the solution, yet I don't hear any discussion, I don't read anything about the capture, treatment, and reuse of gray water. Uh, uh, could you just speak up a little? Sure. You talk about recycling being part of the solution, but I don't read anything much and I don't hear anything about the capture, treatment, and reuse of gray water. Could you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, because I think that, and it was about the capture, reuse, and treatment of gray water. Um, we, to some extent, there's some programs, but we have to incent it more, and we have to deal with it more. And it's, for example, when I was in the legislature, uh, I was sort of surprised to find out that one of the biggest barriers to water recycling happened to be the salt release from water softeners. And one of the places was Dixon, that it was going to cost $20 million to build a treatment plant uh, because so much salt was going in their aquifer that had to be treated if they wanted to recycle it and use it. And in the end, it led to reform of uh, certain water softener stuff, the incentives. In the wastewater, you know, it's interesting because on the coast, uh, there is now a budding movement for desal, which would be the subject of a class all by itself. It's uh, higher energy uh, intensive than most other water supply options. Um, where you do an intake of water in the ocean is a big issue given marine life. How you dispose of the brine is a big deal. But one of the ways you dispose of brine is in an ocean outfall for wastewater. In Santa Cruz, when we explored it, uh, you almost had a, a mutually, mutually exclusive choice. You could do wastewater recycling uh, with the wastewater that would otherwise go out. You could do desal and use the wastewater to mix the brine so it hit the ocean at roughly the same salinity of the ocean. But you had to choose because you couldn't do one couldn't do them both. It would take away your options. And so the question is, is how you deal with all these different issues. And there is an issue of water quality that is still uh, recycling on a certain level is totally fine. And I visited an Orange County recycling plant a couple of months ago where we all took drinks of it uh, afterwards. And um, with the general manager of the water district taking the first drink uh, uh, to convince all of us that uh, that was fine. And yet the public isn't totally there yet uh, on some of the levels of treatment and yet if you have certain closed systems it's only used for irrigation or other things or reuse into toilet facilities uh, and maybe not for human consumption, there is a higher uh, there is a higher infrastructure cost for the first construction, but the operation of it saves you money in having to not have new water over time. And it is trying to balance that, because in, in government accounting, one of the big nightmares of, for example, a green building is that, and now the cost is coming, so it's really competitive. But if it used to be that it might be five or six percent more to build a, a thoroughly lead building and yet your energy costs 
would pay itself off over five or six years and then you'd have a life of a building still going with lower energy costs. But the way people budget in public accounting, they don't allow you to realize that gain over 10 years. It's what's it cost this year and can we come up with the money and sometimes that's more expensive to do that. That is also true in some ways with water recycling and we have to figure out incentives or financial ways to finance it so that it removes the disincentive to doing it because it's more green or cost efficient over time. Yes, and then I'll get to you. I have a question, I, well, a clarification if I understood you correctly and then I have a, another small question after that. Uh, did you say that it's gonna be 15,000 acres of wetland restoration per year for 15 years? No, 2,000 a year for 15 years. 2,000 years. Although the, the BDCP contemplates as much as 100 or 110,000 over a life of a project, which is 50 or 70 years. But the real goal over 15 is to try to get 30,000, 2,000 uh, acres of wetlands a year. And so are the beneficiaries of the water going to pay for that, or is that side expected to be paid for by the people of California? Right now, that is in the bond, which would be the people of California. And the division has been that the uh, anything on a facility would be off the general fund paid for by beneficiaries. The wetlands restoration uh, would be paid for through a bond and by the public. And there's actually a uh, a sentence in the water bond that says something to the effect of not a dollar from this bond can go to any conveyance facility. It's actually an express uh, thing. Yes. Oh, I'll get to you at some point. Yeah. Controversial question here. Do you um, figure following farmland on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley is going to be part of the water equation of the future? Well, actually, I would call the thermonuclear uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> the question was about whether following land on the west side of the valley will be part of the solution. It's not directly contemplated at this point, but interestingly, it's happening, but it's happening because of water contamination, not because of what the water use is. It's the thermosaline question. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks for being patient. Um, so you said you were trying to work in the framework of current laws and legislation as someone who's been in the field for a long time and in the legislature. If you could change a couple of key aspects of the current laws and legislation to make this easier, uh, what would they be? That's a really good question. The question is what would I change about the current laws? I'm not entirely sure I would change much. Uh, you know, as long as we could do it. The irony is, is that, you know, the governor is really uh, into environmental law reform right now. And I think there's this fundamental dividing line. And the dividing line is, is do you do anything that weakens environmental standards? And I believe no. Do you do anything that uh, affects redundant lawsuits the third time over years into the process? And it seems to me that's where the reform should go and uh, and you know I was uh, last Wednesday afternoon I spent four hours uh, in the Mendocino Redwoods with the Mendocino Redwoods company and and that's a, a, another story for another time but it's fascinating they bought out a conventional company they believe doing habitat restoration is part of their the cost of doing business. They've taken out tons of old culvert bridges, restored real bridges, are restoring habitat, do selective harvesting, no clear cutting. I mean, it's, you, 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 although back in Santa Cruz, they still cut trees. My former constituents would still not like them, uh, no matter how they do it, even if it's sustainable. But <clears throat> turns out that it's owned by the Fisher family, and they own the Oakland A's. And the guy was telling me that. Um, they want to move the Oakland A's to San Jose, and they have a sequa suit, and the sequa suit is from the San Francisco Giants. It's, so it's not really about uh, the environmental process, it's to sort of attack a competitor that might be coming in the market. Th that is the kind of stuff that I'm sure would make the governor crazy. 
Uh, and, and yet, as somebody that was on a local board of supervisors in a city council where everybody was always for planning reform. We want planning reform and then when you watch somebody actually try to do it they could never get it done and I think that's going to be the challenge is how do you really get at what the processes issues are in a way that would make a difference and it doesn't weaken the standards and so I'm actually very pleased to just be working on the Rubik's Cube of water and not be uh, working on that right now. Other questions? I have a question. Okay. From, from the title of your talk, will we actually be able to decide something? What will be the conditions necessary for a decision to be made on the Delta? I think it'll be that, an, uh, the question is what will the uh, conditions uh, be that would allow a decision to actually be made on the Delta? I think it gets back to the question you asked. If we have uh, enough stakeholder support from a broad range that believe that it's something that has to be fixed and it's a reasonable thing and it doesn't damage their interest too much, we can get there. And we have a chance. This is one of those, you, you see it was really weird because when I was young I was very idealistic. I thought there were all these things you could do, you want to do in your career. And I didn't understand there would be certain windows and if the window closed you might not get it. I mean healthcare is one. The window opened in 1993. It didn't open again until 2009. If it was missed then we wouldn't have another window open until uh, I was safely way into Medicare. And so uh, that is true on water. It seems like the window opens about every 10 or 15 years and we have this unique time. And the other thing that's unique that I never thought of when I was younger, never occurred to me there would be such a major impact by whether the state government was in political alignment with the federal government. And I had this, excuse me, from my perspective, misfortune to be a mayor and city council member. Eight of the nine years Ronald Reagan was president. I was in the legislature. George Bush was president the whole time. And now finally, I'm working for a Democratic governor aligned with a Democratic president where on energy, renewables, and all these things, we are aligned. We are doing things together. And they really want a restoration of the Delta and some long-term solution and are working hand in hand with us. And that's another opportunity that might not be there forever. And so it would be nice to take advantage of that while we can. Any additional questions? We've got plenty of time. Oh, you your whole list. Sorry. Well, actually, while he's bringing it there, there was a question here. Let's. They're, they're, they're trying to take it, so I'll wait. For oh, okay. Sorry. No, um, that's okay. Wondering if you could talk about the difference between the Delta Conservancy and the Delta Stewardship Council, um, and how they also contribute to the BDC process. Okay, the difference between the Stewardship Council and the Conservancy. Hopefully, you learned a little about the Stewardship Council when Phil was here. Uh, they're an appeal body on the BDCP. They're to look at the broad range of things on Delta issues ac uh, across the board, not necessarily just the habitat uh, conservation in the water. And uh, they are appointed uh, at the state level. The governor has most of the appointees, state body. The Delta Conservancy is a whole different thing. and. There are, uh, I think, 11 conservancies now. They are all within my agency. I have personal experience because my legacy bill in the state legislature is I authored the establishment of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. And what conservancies do is they focus on a geographic area. Many of them amazingly have dual goals of economic development and environmental protection. And it's a way to focus, like the Coastal Conservancy, which is what I had worked with for many years, they do things like they focus on how would you deal with ag land protection on the coast and then implement it. How would you deal with uh, certain sensitive lands up and down the coast and making sure they are protected? How would you deal with economic development that might be sensitive to those environmental things? And there are grants, uh, state bonds, funds, conservative, uh, conservancies, they give grants. Uh, and the key thing, for example, when I was doing the Sierra Conservancy, uh, almost nobody in the Sierra wanted it. And I kept saying, they just thought it was going to be outside state interference in their business. But I argued, look it, the state invests in the Sierra and right now uh, you don't have a seat at the table. 
this is a way to have local officials and state officials meeting together set priorities and goals and with local people at the table do that and it has flipped so there's a begrudging and growing support in the Sierra and we just had a, a wonderful thing happen the first of uh, there's six local elected slots on the board and the first county supervisor that had served on the board for his life just came into the state legislature. So he has a very positive feeling about the Sierra Conservancy. The Delta Conservancy was formed for a very similar reason, to focus resources on the Delta that come from the state with local people at the table and to have that discussion together. And uh, the Campbell Ingram is the executive director and I think he's doing a great job. And, and it is that balance, but it really, there are county supervisors from five different counties that are on the board as well as state appointments. Okay, thanks. And my last question is, um, does the BDCP become part of the Delta Plan? Or I, I'm kind of trying to understand. It is a habitat conservation plan that in essence is consistent with the Delta Plan, but doesn't do everything that is in the Delta Plan, which is why there's a broader mission at the Stewardship Council, if that makes sense. This is being taped so you can look at that four or five times over and see if it, <laughs> if it resonates. Rich. Uh, two questions. The first follows up on the gentleman in the back. Uh, there are some who argue vociferously uh, that conservation, uh, if properly implemented, is the fix and that no engineering solutions are needed to to the long-term enhancement and reliability of California water supply. I'm thinking of Peter Glick, Pacific Institute, as one of the premier spokesmen. What's your reaction to that point of view? Well, it, it's not true. The question is, is conservation the fix? It's not true in the urban areas. You cannot conserve your way out of this in the urban areas where there are many users. The one thing that Peter Glick has done that's been very interesting is he's talked about ag water uh, conservation and uh, a report that the Pacific Institute did was one of the better ones that I'd seen on this because it is so I wanted to do uh, when I was in the legislature egg conservation and it is totally complicated by underlying water rights and allocations so the question is is if whole hosts of farmers have certain allocations and they conserve does that just mean it goes to somebody else? Or unless you change the allocation system, then it goes back to wherever it is. And generally, the overall districts do not want to lose their water rights because they have more senior water rights. Uh, they will give up water rights and they will go to somebody else. So given the allocation system and the conservation system, unless you adjust those in state law in some way, that the benefit to conservation goes back to the whole, all you're doing is cutting the pie differently and not truly achieving. And, so, and that is where I, people argue about the number. Uh, but it's 75 or 80 percent of the water that's developed and used in California goes to ag as opposed to urban uses. I've heard ag people say, oh no, it's in the mid-40s, if you account what flows out to the sea or other things uh, uh, happen in it. But so the trouble is, is that we've been very good about conserving in the urban areas, but we still haven't quite gotten to ag. And, uh, the 20% at 2020 bill that was adopted in the package in 2009, I attempted in my last year in the legislature in 2008, and I was one disgruntled senator from getting it to the governor's desk, and I could get to the 20% on the urban side, and the most I could get out of ag was maybe half a percent by 2020. And so I really learned that there's actually a reason for it, and you have to adjust those other things. You had a second question. Well, and you anticipated my second question to a certain degree with your last one. I mean, part of your purview does not include administering the state water rights system, but as you pointed out, a lot of what you do is directly affected by that. So if you were Emperor King, uh, how would you, and if so, how would you change our system of California water rights? I think if I were to answer that truthfully, I wouldn't even hold my current position, much less be Emperor King. Uh, <laughs> and. and you know, the thing about it is, is water rights uh, have just sort of evolved since California was a state with some significant benchmarks in certain years or times or sessions or laws. And it's gotten to a point that there's very, 
the more senior your water rights are, the less you care about conservation. The more senior your water rights are, a lot of people don't pay at the level that the junior water rights holders do. If you look at who pays more for their water, particularly in ag, they're ones that are more sensitive to conservation. I would love to figure out a way to get at that, but in the existing law, I just don't see how you can do it. And it would really take, uh, you, you know, I've, when I was in the legislature, I visited Brazil on a climate change trip and we were, uh, we were talking with people in the Brazilian government and General Motors about their move to ethanol. And using sugar to ethanol has revolutionized Brazil uh, together with some oil things. They're an exporter of oil. Uh, it's changed their economy. And then this guy that was in the Brazilian government said to me casually as we were walking out, said, well, the decisions were made when we were a dictatorship. I don't think we could have done it if it was a democracy. <laughs> and I think that applies to dealing with water rights in the same way. Other questions? Any additional questions? Okay, all your questions are answered. No more questions on California Oh, you know. Okay. Always an equipment. Um, you mentioned that uh, the new intakes for the tunnels uh, would be at 9,000 CFS? Is that? Would, the question is about the intakes. Actually, the way intakes have been proposed in the current different alternatives, every intake would be at 3,000 cubic feet per second. So if you were doing 9,000, you'd have three intakes. When 15,000 was proposed, it would be five intakes. So it's sort of done in that. And a 9,000 would be three intakes. And, and the tunnel's capacities are, the two of them together is 15,000 or is it? 15, no, it would, be, it would be a permitted capacity of 9,000 and a, a cubic feet and it would be gravity flow, which is a key thing because the gravity flow lowers your, your energy consumption and your greenhouse gas emissions pretty dramatically. Any, any last questions? Well, let's all uh, give a big thanks to. Thanks for having me.